Hey there everyone, AJ back again for the Mighty Glue Stick channel. I recently asked the community for their votes on which area to explore next and the result showed a lot of interest in the positive and negative material planes. So, I thought I'd start with the positive plane and gather up the lore on this location for the Mighty Glue Stick Explorers video, or the Explorers series as I call them. In the beginning, Gary Gygax included the fundamental sources for the elements, the positive, negative, earth, fire, air and water planes, that were the stuff from which the reality of the prime material world was made. There have been reworkings and rehashings of this general concept over the decades, but rather than give a history lesson on what was, I'd rather detail what is, the current most generally accepted and I think useful version of the uh, positive material plane. So in a nutshell, just like in the elemental plane, there is a more hospitable border region, in this case called the quasi-plane of radiance, and there is the full-forced pure positive energy plane, which is as hostile to mortal creatures as the other pure elemental zones. The elemental planes were not originally in any way hospitable, certainly not in the original Monster Manual or various Dragon Magazine articles or the Fiend Folio or the module derived from the Princess of Elemental Evil found there, or a few of uh, which Frank Menzer included in the adventure called, somewhat ironically considering my last video, The Egg of the Phoenix in 1982, which features Ogremok, uh, who got some attention in 4th edition, and I'll be bringing you videos on him and Oli Hydra and Imix and Jan Sibin, the princes of elemental evil. Gygax then brought out his own very famous adventure, Temple of Elemental Evil, in 1985, and the next decade of the game saw the elemental planes become actual locations one could visit in the game. But of course, it was the advent of Planescape that really opened the doors to the D&D cosmos, which was really the entire point of that setting. All 16 elemental planes got some attention in the Planescape campaign setting published in uh, 1994. However, the elemental planes only really came into their own with the publication of Planescape expansion, The Inner Planes, in 1998, which devoted a full chapter to each of the 16 planes. By focusing on the inhabitants and numerous sites of each plane, the book provided a sound basis for adventuring, and one that remains a useful baseline starting point for the elemental planes to this day. In our current edition, 20 years later, 20 years. After a lot of different experiments with the inner and outer plane cosmology, the four elemental planes are back, but they remain tightly integrated with the material plane as its creative foundation. The para-elemental para -elemental planes are also returned for the first time since Planescape, but they've got more evocative names. The Plane of Ash is known as the Great Conflagration. The Plane of Ice is the Frostfell. The Plane of Magma is the Fountains of Creation. The Plane of Ooze is the Swamp of Oblivion. And additionally, Elemental Chaos is its a churning realm uh, within which the inner planes are held. This organisation reflects Mike Mills' goal to make the Elemental Planes a place to visit and explore, a notion influenced by the writing of Michael Moorcock and Roger Zlasny. As a result, the Elemental Planes are habitable towards their interiors where they touch the material plane and weirder toward the outskirts where they descend into the Elemental Chaos. So you have these bordering planes, which I think is a really good trope. And this certainly is the case for the positive and negative material planes. So as we get into it, what is the positive plane like? The energy planes are unique in that they're not composed of matter, but rather a tangible form of creativeness or destructiveness. All life or unlife depends on them. Despite this, energy elementals or other forms of native life are not that common in the plane and pure positive energy is just a bound. The zag -yar, or Enagons, are the and the Ravid are the kind of native creatures one can find there roaming about, but the plane is vast and is actually constantly creating new life forms, most of which reach their full potential as super energized, energized non-biological entities in the blink of an eye. To all intents and purposes, they exist as brief, sentient explosions of organization and emotion, which form a constant physical and mental roar of activity. Creatures of positive energy generally only become aggressive if they're directly attacked and largely ignore visitors from prime material planes, as to them we're just a shadow, um, almost lifeless, barely functional and very ill-equipped to function properly. We seem very sluggish, rigid, cold and full of decay, and if anything we're kind of hideous and sad at the same time. There are visitors from nearby bordering planes, uh, the inner planes, so one can find the quasi-elementals here, mostly steam, crystal, and the spectacular radiance elementals. Radiance quasi-elementals look like rapidly turning spheres of multicolored light. They are rarely found on the prime material plane, and then only in areas where amazing radiant effects are taking place, such as a meteor shower, skimming a planet's atmosphere, creating an amazing light show, multiple rainbows arcing through the sky, intense summer light dancing through a field of refractive crystals, and so on. 
The quasi, uh, the Radiance Quasi Elementals normally attack with beams of pure light, um, each of which has a different energy effect determined randomly. So basically a colour spray. Obviously these creatures are absolutely devastating to the undead, much as hugging a fire elemental is lethal to most ordinary living beings from the prime material plane. The radiant positive energy just pouring out of these entities is more than a prime material creature can handle. Um, even for brief exposure may result in sunburnt skin, scorched clothing, involuntary emotional outbursts, radiation sickness, electrical shocks, lung irritation and trauma to the eyes from the intense light. Beings from the positive material plane tend to communicate telepathically, but again this is an intense form of it where they share a raging torrent of thought and emotion. The volume of their telepathy goes up to 11, so to speak. Unless some serious magical protection is applied before arriving, the first impression of the positive material plane will be intense, literally blinding light, followed by an influx of vital energy. Every cell in the body is super invigorated. There is a swell of enthusiasm, rage, elation, nervousness, er irreverence, an overwhelming urge to unleash every ounce of might. There is a destructive manic frenzy to such a massive influx of vital power, and it's actually lethal because the healing energy is unstoppable. Your character gains 2d6 hit points per round. Once that number exceeds twice your character's maximum hit point total, they physically explode which is one of the more famous side effects of this, um, this positive plan. The environment is quite hostile. There is no atmosphere, uh, which is just as well, since the sound of constant thundering explosions would deafen the character very quickly. And the fast healing of this plane generally prevents death by asphyxiation, starvation, and the flesh will just stitch itself back together constantly. But it's an extremely painful experience, so travelers will need to provide a means to breathe, eat, and protection from the relentless overhealing effect. They'll need a means to uh, communicate in the vacuum as well. There are magical items that you can have, such as a ring of protection from positive energy. Um, the main side effect of wearing one of those, of course, is that you're immune to healing energies, even beneficial ones. Vision is limited to 30 feet. Uh, anyone, anyone much further than, than that, uh, being adjacent to each other, will see everyone around them in the immediate area as uh, darker shapes against this blinding glare, because the radiance just contrasts so heavily. None, uh, no non-enchanted objects will suffer from disintegration unless they're protected, and spells of darkness are just snuffed out, being completely negated by the torrent of light. There are frequent bursts of energy. Um, they erupt like miniature suns, doling out 3d10 temporary hit points, in which case these uh, stack with any other gains that your character is getting. Remember, this isn't damage, this is healing. Your character must also save or be blind for up to 10 rounds. Um, without magical eye protection, they'll suffer blindness, true blindness, within 24 hours. And there is um, subjective directional gravity, where the strength of gravity on the plane with this trait, has, um, it's the same as the material plane, but each individual chooses the direction of gravity's pull. Such uh, a plane has no gravity for unattended objects and non-sentient uh, creatures. This sort of environment can be quite disorientating to a newcomer, but it's common on these weightless planes. Characters on a plane with subjective directional gravity can move normally along a solid surface by imagining down is under their feet. If suspended in mid-air, the character flies by merely choosing a down direction and essentially falling along that path. This can be dangerous, um, a dangerous way to travel as they will fall 50 feet in the first round and speed up to 300 feet in the next and subsequent rounds hurling along in a straight line at terminal velocity. In order to stop, the character has to slow their movement by changing the designated down direction. With no other distractions, this is easy enough to do, but when in combat or concentrating on something else such as spellcasting, the shifting of subjective downward directions requires a DC-12 wisdom check. Um, and in combat or in situations where you're falling towards an object, it can be quite hairy. One interesting aspect of the positive healing overcharge of the plane is that creatures charged up with twice their normal hit point total can retain those hit points for up to 1d20 rounds before they fade away if they return to the prime material plane. So that can be quite an interesting effect if you've got a means to plane shift and back again instantly. Uh, you can overcharge yourself with healing if you manage to travel to the positive material plane. The positive material plane is infinite. It is a cosmic um, realm in its scope and not a uniform place. There are many zones, millions of unique locations and all manner of exotic beings. 
There are objects called life pearls that are solidified in concentrated positive energy that can cure the sick and return people from the dead. There is the bastion of unborn souls, um, which is a place that souls originate from. And there's something in it that's uh, well, it's basically forbidden to all immortals and gods and infernal powers to interfere in any way. It's some sort of a, um, a super, super contract that they will have to follow. Um, there are the quasars, which are majestic constructs built by the angels that guard celestial treasures and conceal ancient secrets behind incredibly powerful enchantments and structures that draw their durability, durability from the infinite power of the plane itself. The quasars look like brilliantly shining stars and crazed in blue skin, and they have the power to blind anyone in a 120-foot radius and fire beams of energy that can disintegrate targets as the spell-like effect. So pretty powerful. There are also all kinds of uh, very dangerous events, such as towering energy pillars that swallow up anything before them in a gigantic solar conflagration. There are other energy explosions that can cause inanimate objects to be infused with animate life and can be very awkward if it just happens to be your helmet or your pants that get animated. There are highly energized crystalline structures where radiant civilizations exist, such as the Lumi, who live in towering cities perched in serene orbits, just distant enough for them to sweep around each other in majestic patterns to provide a ever-changing constant display of spectacular prismatic patterns as the light reflects and reflects from their crystalline structures. The Lumi are stout, uh, almost dwarf-like, luminous humanoids who are composed of pure minerals. They have no neck. I mean, as in no neck. It's a space. Their head just hovers in place where they would normally expect a head to be. They craft weapons and armor to a very high quality, and their entire culture is based on an absolute reverence for the holy light of their realm. The rulers are the religious elite known as the High Ecclesiastics, and the, all governance flows from the congregations of their fortified, massive, and very well-defended cathedrals. Individuals are fanatically devoted to the concept that it is their race's mission to wipe out all liars and deceivers in the multiverse, and someday, soon, when the ordained moment occurs and the order is given, they will begin their genocidal crusade, pouring out of the positive material plane into the material universe to extinguish the life of all liars and deceivers. They're not actually too bad to deal with. Just remember to never, ever, under any circumstances, be less than absolutely honest with them, or they'll most likely kill your character. The Ravid, as mentioned, are seven foot long serpents that have one arm growing from just behind their dragon like head. They have the power to animate inanimate objects and they usually have a swarm of them which follow along after them in a somewhat comical fashion. They have a respective, uh, respectable bite, um, but being whipped by their tail inflicts nasty, nasty wounds on the undead. But for the living, it just creates an unpleasant tingle. So they're not actually that dangerous. There are all sorts of other creatures, many with unique traits similar to those creatures um, in the prime material plane. As a general rule, the creatures that you find there are able to fly. They have an aura that heals all living creatures um, of one hit point of damage per round within five feet of them. They can fire a beam of light that harms the undead and heals the living. And they usually glow brightly like all the time. You can find structures in the positive energy void that have been there for a very long time. There is a monastic citadel that floats around called the Hospice and is populated by undying holy knights who restore the badly wounded back to health. And the whole place is quite a crossroads for good aligned interdimensional travelers and is well protected by a legion of golems. As mentioned, there are the Enagons all over the place. The Zagyars tend to cluster around places where birth or life is occurring, and they also infuse creatures near them with positive healing energy and blow up like little grenades if they're killed, so just be wary. First, uh, uh, finally, there are the prison cells created by the gods and archmages and powerful, powerful clerics long ago to lock away powerful enemies for eternity. The imprisoning cells take on a wide array of shapes and types. They may be sealed by massive structures, uh, weathering the more violent flares of energy, or feed on the energy power itself to power force fields and enchantments that create food, water, and air for the occupants. So they may appear to just be floating in space, but in actual fact, the entire structure is an enchantment um, that's kind of invisible unless you run into the wall that's locking them in there. So moving on, and with a final note that do not forget that uh, to give the characters one hell of a case of sunburn if they're not well protected from all that light. 
we uh, now move away from the furious heart of the positive energy plane and into the border regions, the much more hospitable quasi-elemental plane of radiance. And there are also quasi-elemental planes of steam, lightning and minerals. So they're closely associated with that area. And I'll give you a brief rundown of those before taking you to the quasi-elemental plane of radiance. The quasi-elemental plane of lightning is where the positive energy plane intersects with the plane of elemental air. This is also called the plane of storms or the vengeful land or the great illumination. As um, at the borders with air, you can find a continual thunderstorm with a constant barrage of lightning bolts arcing between ominously dark clouds. The atmosphere is filled with a sharp tang of ozone and a deafening cacophony of thunderclaps. All forms of electrical discharge can be found here. Ball lightning, sheet lightning, you name it. It is said that quasi-elemental creatures cavort amid the chaos and the most well-known structure where um, there stands at the border between the positive energy plane is called the Mysterious Tower of storms, a gateway to a continuous torrent of incredible electrical power that issues from the stupendous wall of pure brilliance, which is the border to the elemental plane of energy, uh, of positive energy. The quasi-elemental plane of lightning has borders with the positive material plane, as well as the planes of air, radiance, smoke, steam, and ice. The quasi-elemental plane of minerals exists between the planes of positive energy and elemental earth. Upon crossing the border from the plane of Earth, the entropy-fighting influence of the positive energy plane manifests in constantly growing veins of crystal and metal-bearing ore which permeate the rock, which itself becomes black marble. All manner of gems and metals are aggregated in their pure forms and laced through the marble, becoming increasingly fragile and vibrating with energy as they approach the border, until finally shatter shattering at the fluttering a fluctuating cliff face border with the positive energy plane, resulting in a tumbling asteroid belt of black marble and every kind of precious metal and stone known to man or god. Near the border of the tower uh, is the Tower of Lead, said to contain the most magnificent forge in the multiverse, um, and where master crafters sometimes risk death to perfect their art, because of course they're very close to the positive material plane there, and energy discharges of enormous force are uh, re relatively common. Um, in addition to all of the difficult and deadly conditions of the plane of elemental earth itself, this plane presents even more challenges. The sharp crystalline edges can cut travellers non-native to this plane um, or the plane of elemental earth to fine shreds. Likewise, the delicate insect-like inhabitants of these areas are very beautiful um, and, and these jeweled creatures um, with their sharp angular features consider the beings um, from the prime material worlds to be bags of precious reactive liquid that we call humanoid life forms, but um, to them they're just very valuable resources because liquids are so rare here. They harvest and trade all the fluids inside mortal creatures with little consideration because to them prime material life is just totally alien. They don't even recognize um, us as living beings. By far the greatest danger to any not native to this plane is fossilization. The um, the ambient effect of this plane, the longer one stays in, the, in this place, the greater the chance of forces acting on the minerals will turn your character to stone, if you're lucky, since there's a spell designed to cure that condition, or it can transform your character into crystal, um, veined granite marble or gemstones. Magical protection from petrification doesn't prevent this sort of fossilization entirely. On top of that, any crystal that... Um, formed in this intense pressure and zero gravity of the prime material, uh, the, the plane of minerals, will almost certainly shatter when brought into um, a plane with gravity and normal atmospheric, um, atmospheric pressure. For some though, this is well worth the risk, and you can find uh, colonies of Galabdur, dwarves, Dwaga, as well as lots of gnomes, including Gnome Janazi, who regard this plane as sacred to their god and their race. The quasi-elemental plane of minerals borders the planes of positive energy, earth, radiance, magma, steam, and ooze. The quasi-elemental plane of steam is where the positive energy plane intersects with the plane of elemental water. The temperature of this plane varies from cool to near boiling, creating the conditions for all varieties of mist, fog and vapour. The entire plane is suffused with a soft glow where, uh, which eventually becomes a brilliant glare at the border of the positive energy plane. Near the border is this uh, strangely named Tower of Ice, which is uh, where alchemists, um, outer planet alchemists, have built an enormous laboratory to enhance potion brewing. Um, air breathing, lung using creatures find it difficult to get enough air from the muggy water vapor and are effectively slowed 
by water gathering in their lungs. It's a slow effect, but essentially the body is often cooler than the surrounding air, so water will condense and slowly fill the lungs, resulting in internal drowning. Overall though, this is the most hospitable of the positive quasi-elemental planes, and has a lively and interesting population from a variety of different uh, planes of existence. For those of you who would love to run a, a steampunk D&D campaign setting, this would be the ideal location for it, as the place is big enough to house entire planets, and the space between them contains limitless clouds and complex thermal currents where one can ride a steam-powered sailing vessel. This plane borders the planes of positive energy, water, minerals, ooze, lightning, and ice. Finally, the quasi-elemental plane of radiance. It touches the plane of positive energy, fire, lightning, smoke, minerals, and magma, and is pretty spectacular. There is a twisting and soaring rainbow river that sweeps and wends its way around floating moats of crystal and rock, most of them populated by unique flora and fauna, very unique. The positive material plane shines down from above, filtered by the many floating moats. It looks like well, it looks a lot like the heart of a galaxy, just an amazing light show of epic proportions. And far below, there are more twilight bowls of uh, distant stars if you, as you look directly down, both of which horizons are basically infinitely distant. You could travel for a thousand years and never reach them. Floating around far above and between the islands are clouds of different coloured gases, looking for all the world like swirling nebula, with bright, radiant crystals shining like pulsars through the infinite spectrum, creating an ever-changing vista that puts every sunset or sunrise to shame. Mortal creatures who see this vista for the very first time, well, it's a deeply emotional experience that one never forgets. There is a diverse population here, but again, the brilliant light and relatively harsh conditions mean that magic is a necessity for creatures native to the prime material plane in order to survive. As otherwise, there's simply not enough food to eat or water to drink. It's always as bright as a really hot noonday here. There are precious few shadows, as the light just reflects and bounces off everything. Native creatures have no problem seeing in the glare, but it's damaging to the eyes of prime material humanoids, who will need sunglasses and protection for their skin. Light spells are enhanced, darkness spells are very difficult to cast here, and there's a near constant threat of characters being captivated by the dazzling beauty of the place. It's a DC 15 wisdom saving throw every time they encounter some new vista or a kind of unique terrain, or they'll fall into a stunned daydream for 1d4 minutes just standing there agape, just looking around going, wow. The Plane of Radiance is home to Quartals, Lamazus, uh, Will-O-Wisps, and Lilians. There's also some Harpies, Rakshasas, and Ravids, quite a few Sphinxes, a few Gnomes and Humans, and all Celestial Beings tend to hang out here as they just really love the climate. Also, it's not unheard of to find some Immortals from various origin realms who have made a home for themselves here in the peace and quiet, no longer concerned with the goings-on back in the Primaterial Plane. Mostly, the population consists of the native wildlife, who share similar radiant properties um, to the ones that you find in the, the positive elemental plane, allowing you to apply a basic template to any existing animal block, nicely and simply. Um, yeah, and of course you've got the glimmer folk. But before I talk about them, just a few notes on the general conditions and some interesting features. First, the gravity again is subjective. You can walk around on the rainbow paths, uh, through the sky here, but entering into the radiant nebula cloud will result in a character winding up stunned for one to four minutes in the air can be can be fouled by exotic gases, but otherwise it's just you're just surrounded by epic beauty. There's a 15 foot wide indestructible rainbow bridge that connects these floating islands and the rainbow bridge extends to other planes. Whenever a rainbow appears in the prime material plane, for instance, there's a chance that it has a portal to the plane of radiance, and it's as simple as walking up to the light with a sure determination to cross over into the realm of light, and then just stepping up into the uh, rainbow. One part of the rainbow bridge connects to a huge roaring waterfall that pours from a massive crystal prism um, out onto the bridge, where these waters fall and vanish into um, this portal, which can lead to any location in the multiverse and any time. But good luck, because nobody seems to know how to control or predict just where the Traveller will appear, or when. However, an immortal radiant titan named Rilla, uh, Riss, 
who wields a legendary sword called the Crystal Lightning, stands guard at the waterfall and will not allow mortals to dive into it willy-nilly for their own good, and to safeguard the sanctity of the time stream. He's more than happy to chat for a while, though, if you're just there to sightsee and uh, marvel at this amazing, incredible feature, um, which is just cosmically amazing. Chromatic tornadoes are what passes for weather on this plane, as well as radiant precipitation. When the locals say, be careful of the light rain, they do not mean a soft drizzle of water. They mean that lasers are shooting out of the sky. The chromatic tornado hits very much like a colour spray spell, along with about 66 damage every round, until your character is thrown clear, usually well away from the rainbow path, so the character will be floating in the void with subjective gravity. Now they're left with the fact that if they approach within a certain range of a solid mass, such as um, the crystal, the rainbow path, or one of the earth moats, they'll fall towards it, just as if they'd um, been tossed high into the air. Falling onto a bridge is your best bet, because the mass is so low, so the gravity grabs your character about 30 feet or so away from the bridge. But the larger moats can see your character falling for 100 feet and landing pretty damn hard, unless they have the means of flying or casting featherfall. Just something to keep in mind. Large earth and crystal moats do float around unless they're tethered by the rainbow pathways and the locals just seem to know where a particular moat is, even if it drifts along slowly. The largest moats are big enough to house cities and farmlands, including the native vegetation, which is an awesomely fantastic kind of crystal tree forest. The glimmer folk are kind of like the more aloof and eladrin style of elves. They are taller than humans, but thin, almost frail, quite adept at moving around in their homeland and not at all welcoming of strangers. They are actually pretty xenophobic and intolerant of outsiders, particularly the drab, smelly and diseased, dull and brutish beings from the Prime Material Plane, who they just refer to as primes in a derogatory sense. They speak sylvan, favour long swords and longbows, of course, and wear crystal steel chain shirts and light metal shields. They have deeply tanned skin of all, so, all types of shades and any shade of fair hair. Their eyes are a total glossy black, and the adults have three or sometimes more glowing orbs that orbit around their head and shoulders that they call nimlies. These are just made of light, about two inches in diameter, which float within about a foot of them at all times. They're an extension of the glimmer folk's life force, and uh, the expended ones reappear when they take a long rest. Nimlies are a natural part of the glimmer folk's existence, and are thought of in the same terms that most races consider their hair colour. The Nimli glows with a constant light equivalent to a candle, um, and since several of these lights orbit around them constantly, glimmer folk suffer a minus two penalty on high checks um, for each Nimli that they have active, so up to minus six. Nimlies do not interfere with um, any other spells, including mirror image or invisibility though. As a standard action, a glimmer folk can use one or more of their nimlies to cast a spell. Doing so causes the nimly to burn out, it sort of gets expended like an energy cell, fading out of existence until the glimmer folk has a chance to rest. After that, they uh, any used nimlies reappear. And the glitter folk can use one of their nimblies to reproduce the effects of spells including uh, dancing lights, days or flare. They can use two of them to power up a colour spray or a magic missile. And by expending all three of their nimblies, they can cast a mirror image. Um, the glimmer folk themselves are immune to all sort of pattern uh, magic damage. They've got dark vision, of course. And uh, yeah, they're pretty resilient, pretty resilient to any sort of um, radiant light attack. They are related to elves, distantly, so they do uh, eat and sleep, but uh, most other life forms on the plane of radiance don't sleep, and they subsist solely on natural light and nebula gases. There are some very large creatures that eat crystals, but they move very slowly and don't bother anyone that doesn't bother them. Um, and of course the locals will strongly encourage you not to bother them. Some of the native f flying animals have the ability to pass through any transparent material, including crystal trees, but may accidentally fly into reflective, uh, non-transparent mirrored surfaces as they um, accidentally mistake them for, for transparent objects, which can sometimes cause a small explosion as they expend all their body uh, energy in one go essentially grounding themselves into a material object. It's a very, very pretty place, but it can be dangerous and exotic and highly charged, so it pays to stay frosty. For more information on the Glimmer Folk, take a look at Dragon Magazine, magazine number 321, 
If you're inspired to create interesting exotic locations for an encounter or plot centered on this plane or the positive energy plane, please feel free, feel free to talk about it in the comment section down below. I welcome the highly creative and passionate minds of our community to share and enjoy with others um, their creativity. It's always a pleasure. That's it for me. Thanks for listening. I'll be back again for more for you uh, very soon. And uh, don't forget to check us out on Discord um, and keep an eye on the community channel as I talk about various things that are coming up for the Mighty Clue Stake. Thanks for listening. Have a good game, everybody.